uh, okay. So let's talk about exponential families. So these are interesting uh, parametric families of probability distributions. And um, uh, because you're behind, I'm not going to be able to do them justice, even if you were not behind. Um, but we're going to like go over a list of these, the properties of these, but they're very interesting. You could um, teach a whole course on exponential families. Um, and there's a very nice interplay between like statistics, optimization, analysis, like major theory, uh, like all these things come together. And um, the advantage of them is that you can define uh, parametric families on any like space. So if you have spaces of like some exotic objects, you want to put a distribution on, um, you're not really sure, uh, especially if they're discrete, discrete mathematical object. Um, this gives you a way of doing it. Um, so the idea is that you have some general sample space and a general parameter space. As long as I can define, let's say, um, like mappings from these two spaces into RD, uh, then I can define these families. So suppose I have a map T that maps an, like an element of this uh, abstract sample space into RD. So it has the components and the other one eta maps um, omega into RD. So this map also has the components. Um, and then there's this other ingredient, which is uh, some sort of a measure in this space. So you already have to have uh, like some underlying measure, like um, let's say if this was um, Euclidean space, it would be like a Lebesgue measure. If it's a discrete space, it's usually the counting measure. Uh, we'll see. And then there is a function, a positive function, um, um, x from x to r. And so the exponential family uh, would be um, described by this density. So it's a parametric family of densities with respect to this underlying measure nu. Um, and um, sort of they're dominated by this. So it's a dominated family. Uh, you can see there's this exponential here, and then there's this H, which um, uh, you can see that this is in the factorization form, basically, if you recall. The factorization theorem tells you that if, if I can write a density like um, G theta of some statistic times H of X, then T is, um, sufficient statistic. This is conveniently written in that form. And so you can immediately looking at this, you see that T of X is a sufficient statistic. So by design. And so for that reason, they say this is like an exponential family with sufficient statistic T. Um, this eta is a parameterization. You can reparameterize, we'll see in terms of different parameters. And um, this inner product here, so it's the inner product in RD, um, spelled out is here. Um, this guy is uh, basically you take the inner product of these two vectors, right? So for each x and each theta, you have two vectors. You take the inner product, which is the sum of the products of the elements. Um, another way of writing it, if you're not comfortable with this notation, is just this transpose times c of x. This is another way people write inner products. But that's a number, so this is a real number. Um, and so this is the form of density. This guy is there to make sure that everything uh, integrates to one. So that's a probability distribution. Um, this is for convenience here. So if you uh, are comfortable with measure theory, you can like absorb this into new, would be like another measure, but for convenience. Uh, so some people, for example, that just assume it to be one. So this is this can be absorbed into new. Uh, sometimes I write um, um, basically H. This, this, I define it to be a new, new. So you can think of this as a density, which is like the new of this new measure. So I can work with that so that I don't have to carry this, but um, it's there for convenience. But that's it. Okay, so that's the general exponential family. And from this definition, a lot of properties follow. Okay, yes. Quick question, what do we call the family and not just a set? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. So 
like the terminology, I'm not sure where it, where it comes from, but you started with a family of probability distributions, if you remember. So we could have called it a set of probability distributions, but people call it a family. Why they call it a family? Like a historical, perhaps. But but we started like we with a like a we recall parametric family of distributions. I don't know if there's a good reason why why they call it a family, not for example a set or a collection or. Uh, but that's the terminology that's common. Okay, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It's a good question. I, I never questioned the terminology. But um, it's common, and especially in the case of exponential family, it's really common. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Mathematically, there's like, there tends to be an aversion to if, if, if you have something like indexed by something unknown to calling it a kind of, I guess. Really? Okay. There, there, there are issues in, in whether uh, it actually is set or not. You know, there are some chances that it's probably not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's What what was that? For any collection of function or measures, like it is for family. Okay. Yeah, it I mean I, I don't have any specific sort of uh, there's no I I don't have a specific reason. If it's like a convention, it's it's fine. Yes. Uh, but it, it is really a convention in this case. Um if there's a good reason behind it, you guys can dig it up. Um, um, but it doesn't matter for us um, as long as you understand that this is like parameterized by like that. It's not a single probability, probability distribution. It's it's a collection, a set or a family of probability distribution. And so, oftentimes the parameter of interest is either theta or some other reparameterization of this. So you want to identify the particular distribution among this or the density that the data is generated from. Any other questions? OK, so, so what happens is once you specify these ingredients, uh, t, eta, and h, and this underlying measure nu, this a is automatically defined. So that's why it's not like listed. So if you think about the uh, um, normalization criteria. So you have to have, um, so I can write this as like e to the uh, eta theta e of x times e to the negative a theta, right? Um, and so if I enforce the condition that this has to um, be um, one, Right. Um, what I would get is that this term is going to come out integral e to the eta theta t of x d um, nu x. I think there's an h there as well. So this has to be one. And so this is an integral. This is like a number dependent on theta. If you rearrange, so move this to the other side, um, you would get uh, e to the a theta has to be equal to that integral, right? And then the log of it, um, a theta would be the log of that integral, okay? So a comes out in terms of the other prime. Okay, uh, so so that's that's the what what I have here. Um, again, this is like h of x d nu x if you want. So this is not something um, strange. It's just once you write down the normalization idea, or like that this has to normalize. This turns out to be the the expression for a and. So these integrals are like conveniently always like exist. They, they could be infinite, but this is an exponential. This is like a positive function. Things are measurable, et cetera. And this is always like either it's integrable, but it could be infinite. So, um, so the, the set of parameters theta for which this is finite, um, those are the ones for which you can normalize the density. So that's the, um, that's called the, parameter space. I'm here calling it the actual parameter space. It's not a um, common name, but you started from some omega that you just had. 
uh, and then you like put these ingredients, it, it could be that not for all omega, this integral is finite by the subset of omega. So for whatever subset of omega that you have, I'm calling it the actual parameter state. Um, the actual is not, um, it, it's not a um, standard term. This is just, um, there are a lot of different kind of like, we will see natural parameter states or mean parameter states. But this is just uh, to emphasize that the set of all thetas for which this is finite is really the parameter space that you're working with. For other thetas, this is not a density. Right, not, not a density. It's not a density of a probability distribution. So. Okay, so this A has a lot of interesting properties that we'll, we'll see. It's sometimes called log partition function or Kamielan generating function. Uh, we'll see why this is called that. Um, it's called cumulant generating function because its derivatives gives you the cumulants of the distribution. Um, by factorization theorem, T of X is indeed sufficient. And um, we also mentioned that the representation is not unique. The simplest thing to note, for example, is that I can multiply this by two, this one by one half, and call this new one half T of X another T of X, uh, that parameter another uh, parameterization. That sort of is showing you that the, the T of X or eta are not sort of identifiable, so it's not unique. Um, I can absorb something into A of eta and so on. So there is some sort of a um, leeway in defining uh, or like these parameters or like ingredients. Okay, questions? Okay, so that's the basic idea. Here's a very simple example. A lot of um, common parametric families that you know are um, exponential families. You'll, you'll show them in the hard problem. The, the basic one is the Bernoulli one. So here, for example, the sample space is, you can think of it as just um, two points, zero or one. Um, this new, if you want to be precise, this is going to be counting measure. Um, so this is a density respect to the counting measure, which is essentially the probability mass function. So this is going to be um, what, what you expect. So this is what we have seen before. And then you can write it in the exponential family form. Um, take the log of it and put an exp, exp behind it. And then you rearrange, you get this expression. This is not really. Um, so what I'm doing is like writing it as exp log this guy and then expand the log and then rearrange. So. Uh, you get that expression, you can see that this, this conveniently looks like what we want. This is like eta of theta. This I can call T of X, for example. This would be negative A theta. And um, so that's a, um, an exponential family. Um, one dimension, for example, this D would be the dimension of the family. I don't know if I mentioned here, but, but this is called a D dimensional family. So this is a one dimensional family. Um, that, that actual parameter space is, is like zero, one, um, excluding the boundaries, okay. Um, the, the reason why we exclude the boundaries in that, in that, that those cases would be a point mass and this exponential cannot be zero. So it's um, like the parameter space in this case um, is like that, okay. Sounds good. Okay, then you can do like normal. Um, normal with mean mu and, and variance sigma squared. Um, this looks like a two parameter family. And indeed it's a two parameter family. You write down the density. This is here, it's uh, nu is the Lebesgue measure. Lebesgue. And this theta is really the usual density. Um, you rearrange, um, so expand, and you can like collect the terms that involve x. There is, you can put here, so you can see that this is going to be our a of theta. Um, and this one is like inner product between, you can write it as x, x squared, and then inner product with um, mu over sigma squared here and negative one over two sigma squared. And you can see that I can call this. Um, uh, sorry, T of X, right? 
and this other guy is going to be called uh, eta, sorry, yeah, eta of theta. So here that, that subplot space is uh, R, and, and this T of X maps, um, you can see maps R to R squared. Right, so we have a two-dimensional family. Um, from the properties of the Gaussian distribution, you already know, for example, that sigma squared cannot be negative because it turns out to be the variance. And we can um, sort of see if you have defined things like this, then um, the prim this, this would be like theta one, this would be theta two. The, the actual parameter space where um, the density actually like integrates is where theta two is positive. Okay, so you could have started, for example, with something like, um, actually, this is not, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a little bit tricky because um, it already comes from, but, but you know, you understand that if these are the parameters, the second one cannot be, um, uh, neither zero nor, uh, if it's zero, it's a well-defined density, but, it, it would be outside the exponential family because it would be a point mass. It can be written as like a density with respect to the Beck measure. Um, if it's negative, this is going to not integrate. And so, um, in this case, you like by previous calculation or knowledge, you already know what the parameter space would look like. Um, um, yeah, there's some sort of one word root two pi here. Yeah, okay, so I, I moved everything here inside. If you think about it, uh, I, I took the log and then this, this put it here. Um, so here in this case, h is one, right? But I could have, for example, called this one over root two pi h and a would be different. So that's another example where you have um, um, ambiguity in the definition, right? Sounds good. Okay, so there are other examples as well. Um, and exa here's a non-example. Okay, let me, I got this Okay. Um, so this is a non-example. So the uniform in zero to theta, uh, you can write the density respect to Lebesgue measure like that. But um, the this is a non-example. You remember this has uh, the property that the densities don't have common support. So it's like one over theta here, zero to theta, and then for another theta it could be like that. For another one it could be like this. So the supports of these densities are different. Um, and so uh, this can't happen because as you may notice, um, this determines the support sort of, and, and because this is always positive, uh, and this depends, the, the part that depends on theta is always positive. Exponential cannot be negative, but it cannot be zero. Yeah. Also not negative, but cannot be zero. So all the members of the exponential family have the common support. So because this, in this case, the support depends on theta, it's not an exponential family. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's um, discuss some regularity conditions. So we're going to make these regularity assumptions about the family. Um, the first one is that um, this omega, I remember this was the set of all theta such that um, a theta is finite. So that's what I call actual parameter space. Um, so the map, the, um, the image of this omega naught under eta is, um, has non-empty interior. That's what we're going to assume. Um, usually at this point, I stop and ask people if they understand, like, do you, do you recall or know what the interior is? So does, does this make sense? It's like a, like a technical condition from analysis. What is the interior of a set? Because we don't have time, I'm not going to spend. All the points on the boundary. All the points on the boundary, what is the boundary? 
It's, it's good. Yeah, yeah. So all the points that are not on the boundary and also not outside. No, yeah. Right. So it's for that side. Yeah, you want. Yes. Um, like all the points that are um, just a little ball around the points. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, for example, if I have do the simplest thing, like um, let's say I have the like, this set in R two. Um, this part is included. This this part is not. Any point inside that I can put a small little ball here that like entirely is in the set is uh, in the interior. So I can go like all the points here would be like because there is no boundary here. So every point in this direction is inside the set, like in the interior, the points that are here, these are the boundary of the set, basically. So the points that are here, um, whatever, like however small you make that little ball, a bit of it is going to be outside. So these are not uh, in the interior. And it's also, the, it's, it's, it's on the boundary. If whatever ball you, you, you put, some of it is inside, some of it is outside. That's to determine the boundary. This is outside, or I don't know what they call it, exterior or not interior, because you can find a ball which is completely inside, outside. So but that's some, some, some sort of uh, topology or real analysis or concept. It's like intuitively very clear. Um, so what we're assuming is that the interior is not empty. And you might ask, oh, my, is it possible to have, we have a, like a non-empty set where the interior is empty? Uh, and we can, yes. Yeah. So examples of a set that is non-empty circle. Yes, yeah, good. So basically like anything in these higher dimensional spaces that like intrinsically, like the dimension is really um, lower. Right, so if you have a set in R2, which is a circle, this is not empty, but every everything on it is a boundary point. So there is no interior. Okay, and also, for example, it depends on um, in which space you look at. So, for example, a, 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 like an interval, um, like an open interval, for example, like minus one and one, uh, as a subset of R, this is like completely interior. Everything is in the interior. As a subset of R2, this has not empty interior. Sorry, empty interior. So everything is a boundary. Okay, so if you view it as a subset of R2. Um, so it's relative to whatever space you're considering. So we want to exclude these cases. For example, uh, the mapping, for example, if you have um, um, Yeah, so for example, if you had this mapping that we had, right? Um, Make sure another good example because it, um, yeah, so for example, if you have some, some mapping like this um, from R to, R2, this will have this property, right? So the image, um, oh, sorry, this is this is not a good example. That, that, uh, that, that. So if theta was like this, um, um, like eta of theta was theta and theta squared, for example, and theta was in R. So um, if you had a parameterization that maps, uh, your parameter is univariate, but you're mapping it to R2, um, th then this this would have a like non-empty interior, so that we want to rule out. You don't want a test that looks like this. So here, uh, omega is so eta is um, from omega to R, and this is a subset of sorry the other way. Um, let's say from R, omega, which is a subset of R, um, to R two. And then eta of omega is the, the dislocation of all these uh, points on this parabola. Yeah, so this has not empty interior. Uh, sorry, empty interior. So we want to rule this out. Okay, so this condition rules cases like that out. Um, and the other one is um, that these um, keys are linearly independent. Um, so these keys are 
um, basically T1 of X up to TD of X. And then there is one, these are random variables, um, uh, sort of random variables, but like, think of this list as some sort of probability measure. If you want, and then these are random variables. This is not a probability measure. So these are gonna be like, yes, random function. I, Functions basically are measurable functions, but but you want um, them to not satisfy a linear constraint. Okay, I, I don't want to be able to write um, an equation um, like this: um, c one t one x up to c d uh, t x, for example, as z zero, where, where no, these coefficients are non-trivial, which means that uh, um, they're not all zero so i don't want something like this so you know linear um linearly dependent um what linearly dependent means from uh, linear algebra this is just saying that the relation like this which is which is a linear dependence of these statistics does not hold almost surely under this measure nu. okay um so an example where this this is violated for example if you have t of x is like x and one minus x, right? Uh, then I can write like t one of x as t two of x is equal to one, and so this always holds, and so this violates it. If I can't do it, then can be getting two holds. So they're linearly independent almost everywhere in new bar, and then you want to say that that is not empty, has not empty interior. Um, these two conditions are going to prevent certain. Um, let's say um, issues. So E2, for example, prevents uh, non identifiability or unidentifiability. Uh, E1 prevents from these eta i satisfying the constraint effectively. Um, so you can see, for example, things that have non empty interior, sort of there is a constraint that they're satisfying. There's a, like a non linear constraint. They're like on a, some sort of a, like a non linear manifold. So this prevents from that from the happening, and E2 prevents um, unidentifiability. So do people remember what non-identifiability, or should we probably say non-identifiable, or unidentifiability? What was identifiability? This was in one of the homework problems. Take two parameterizations, then the boundary has to be different. Yeah, so that's identifiability. Yeah, exactly. So. Different parameters give you different distributions. Um, and if identifiability fails, there, you can find two different parameters that give you the same distribution. Because statistics is all about distributions, that parameter is not identifiable. Those distinctions between those parameters cannot be identified because at, at, at most you can identify the distribution. And um, so this prevents that from happening. Um, so if, if, if a family satisfies E1 and E2, we call it a regular family. Sometimes you, some you'll see some people assume um, a stronger version of E1, which is just that this entire thing is open. Okay, that implies that the interior is, um, so let's say open and non-empty. Um, obviously non-empty, otherwise it doesn't make sense like to consider. Uh, so this implies E1. Um, there are different names that people give to families that satisfy these conditions. So E1 and E2 usually, if a family satisfies this, it's called full rank. And that's what we are going to assume. Okay, full rank exponential families. Some people call like a family that satisfies E1 prime a regular family. And some people satisfy the, the one that like E2 a minimal family. Um, there are different kind of um, terminology, not all agreeing. But full rank is pretty standard. So we're going to stick with this one. And a lot of good things happen in the full rank family. So they're identifiable first. And you can try to argue. Um, moreover, uh, the interesting thing is um, in a full rank exponential family, that minimal sufficient, that sufficient statistic is actually complete. That's what we uh, care about. OK, any questions about these definitions? I had an example here, um, I think I went through. So a Bernoulli model, for example, um, you can try to parameterize by two parameters. So you can say um, there's a probability of coming up like one and coming up 
zero, I'm going to call this P zero, P one, like theta zero and theta one, basically, like e to the theta zero and e to the theta one. Those parameters are not um, independent of each other, right? And you can see that this would uh, introduce this um, constraint among the that sufficient statistics. And um, you can see this is not full rank. And you can see also that because of this constraint, effectively theta naught and theta one are not identifiable. I can, it's, it's not hard to see that I can, uh, there's just one parameter that identifies this family. I can just trade off one for the other and get the same distribution. Um, this was the example that is not full, full rank because it violates the uh, non empty interior condition. Okay, sounds good. So, you know, for, from now on, usually work with full rank exponential families, um, unless like um, you're forced to not, but. Um, if we can, we hold like we prefer a parameterization that makes it full rank. Um, and so the, the, the first result, but the main result is like um, in a full rank exponential family, P is complete. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly go over why it's minimal sufficient. I'm not gonna prove that it's like complete. Completeness follows from an argument which essentially boils down to showing that the Laplace transform is like inverse Laplace transform exists or is unique. So if you have two functions that have uh, the same Laplace transform, then they have to be the same. Uh, or if the Laplace transform of something is zero, then it has to be zero. Um, so there, there are like different like machinery in, let's say, math that you can use to establish that. But for us, um, I'm just going to do minimal sufficiency because it shows you where those conditions come in um, and it might be instructive. So let's try to prove that in a full rank exponential family, this sufficient statistic is minimal, minimal sufficient at least. Um, recall that this, this would be slightly, not just slightly, but it's weaker than completeness. If, if it's something sufficient and complete, then it's minimal sufficient, um, but not vice versa. But this is what I'm going to prove here. The first thing to note is that by factorization, TRMT is um, sufficient. So um, I'm going to write p theta of x as e to the eta theta and t of x. Uh, and I'm going to ignore h. Let's say h is 1 for simplicity. Uh, this has the, like, the form that factorization theorem is designed for. So this shows that t of x is really sufficient um, for the whole family. That's enough to pick a subfamily and show that it's minimal for that subfamily, then we're done. That was one of the results. Okay, so I'm going to pick a subfamily. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to choose a sequence, theta naught up to theta d, um, in the parameter space such that um, let's, let's call the, the, the image under eta, eta i. Um, I, I want to choose them such that, uh, let's say, the difference of eta i minus eta naught, so eta one minus eta naught, eta two minus eta naught, and so on, um, these are linearly independent. Okay. Um, and to see that this is possible, this is possible by E1. Um, the reason is um, um, so why is it possible? Okay, so because uh, this guy, by assumption, is not has not empty interior, there is something in the interior. So I'm gonna pick um, that point. So there is one point, let's say theta naught here, that maps to eta of theta naught. I'm gonna assume that this is in the interior uh, of eta omega. Okay, so there is something in there. Like there is one parameter that goes to something in the interior. Otherwise, the interior would be empty. And then, because this point is in the interior, I can put a ball here of a sufficiently small radius uh, such that that ball is entirely in there. Okay, because it's a full dimensional ball, there's like um, I can like put a coordinate system inside. Like if you pick uh, a d-dimensional basis, which is like the tiny like little pieces so you can make them small enough such that the entire thing is in the ball but because the ball is full dimensional I can put a coordinate system in there like a 
basis. And, and so those would, would be my, the, the endpoints would give you um, the location of these uh, other etas. Okay, so this would be like eta one, this would be eta two, this would be eta three. And this has to come from somewhere like this, this, this would be mapped because this is like in the image of eta. So this is mapped like uh, by eta. Some theta one is mapped to this, some theta two is mapped to that and so on. Okay, some theta three here is mapped to this. And so that's how I get the thetas and then I get the etas. And so the difference of the etas are uh, basically you can, you can make them linear independent if you want, even orthogonal. Um, but linear independent is good enough. So that's where the um, non emptiness of the interior comes in. I can put a full dimensional ball of a like, small radius inside at a certain point which is an interior, and then I have these um, pieces. So that, 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 that's the, like the geometric or like um, metric idea. And then you would, um, the rest sort of follows. So now I have my family, the G plus one parenthesis, this is a subfamily. Um, e is certainly sufficient for that subfamily. I'm just gonna have to prove that it's minimal sufficient for that family, subfamily. Um, and to do that, uh, we know that it's a finite family, the log likelihood ratio, basically process, which is gonna be a vector. So this guy, uh, the likelihood ratio of theta one up to theta d relative to theta naught, um, and then take the logs, this is gonna be minimal sufficient. This has, this family has common support, so everything is fine. Um, and you can see it's like easy to show because this is like P theta. I of X is going to be like E to the eta theta I T of X. This is just an E of eta I T of X. You can form like write a matrix, write this in a matrix form. So um, P of theta I divided by P of eta naught of X would be E to the eta I minus eta naught T of X, right? Uh, if I take the log, um, I get eta i minus eta naught t of x, and this I can write in a matrix form, right? So I can, uh, how did I write it? Uh, a t, so you can think of this, these as, uh, these are vectors, both are in Rd. Uh, I'm gonna put the uh, eta i minus eta, so this would be transpose of this. So eta one minus eta, this transpose, this would be like one, row of this matrix, this is another row, right, up to eta d minus eta naught transpose. And then the entire thing times t of x, t of x is d dimensional, right? Um, this would um, this this would give me, um, these are um, um, different coordinates of the log lecture ratio. So I've, I've written it as, so this would be um, basically, log p theta one x divided p theta naught x all the way to log p e theta d x p e theta naught x okay so we know from previous discussions that this is minimal sufficient right so this other side is minimal sufficient um and this is like a matrix a because things are the way we chose this, um, they're linearly independent. This is uh, a full rank matrix, okay? And so this is like D by D, so it's invertible. So it's a bijection. So I can multiply by A. So this T of X is in bijection to the minimal sufficient statistics, so it's minimal okay? Sounds good. I can invert this matrix by design. And so if I have Px, I have that, I have that, I have Px, so then we have minimal sufficient. So the only thing we use is that we can pick up these theta such that this is um, um, invertible. And this can be done because there is like a little ball that I can put around some image of some parameter and this follows from non-emptiness of interior. So you can see that there's this interplay of uh, um, like analysis and statistics that is interesting. 
Um, usually at this point, some, someone asks, how about the other condition? Do we need the other condition? And I usually uh, forgot, uh, forgot about the. So the only thing we used here is um, E1. We didn't use E2. So it seems like, this is, I think, um, that we don't need E2 at least for this part. But for completeness, I believe we need both. Okay, in any case, in a full rank family, definitely E1 holds, and so this holds. Okay, and then that was the argument. Questions? Yes. I think you still have a other common bottom. I thought you were showing this a minimal solution for the omega zero, is a bad subset of the omega yes. to transfer it to a minimal solution to the whole family. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that was a result that we had, if you recall. There was a result that said if a statistic is sufficient for the whole family and minimal sufficient for a subfamily, then it would be minimal sufficient for the whole family. Oh, that was there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good point. But that's if you go back, it's one of like the formal statements that I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, good point. Any other questions? Okay, so in a full rank exponential family T is complete, although we didn't show it, but we showed some minimal sufficiency, but let's say believe me that it's complete. Um, so now let's move on to do more. Um, what we can do here is we can reparameterize in terms of this eta theta. So once you have from your exotic parameter states, you move to RD, um, I no longer need to work with that exotic parameter. I'm just going to work with the parameter in RD. Okay. So you can think of replacing this with the actual theta, or you can call it like eta if you want, but you can redefine this to be your new parameter. Okay. And if you do that, you get rid of one. Um, like degree of freedom that you have of choosing eta basically. Now, basically, if you choose um, this to each parameter, you're talking about parametric families, like exponential families in RD. So um, in other words, um, you would say that the family is canonical or natural or in natural form if eta theta is equal to theta. Okay, this is another way of stating it. But in a sense, um, exponential families that are in RD, the parameter state is in RD, and that eta for them is just the identity map that is, um, those are called canonical or natural. So these are the only things basically that you need to worry or study. Um, this extra eta is here for convenience. Okay, and, but mathematically, you just need to worry about these things. So that get, gets rid of one degree of issue. So the only thing that remains to choose uh, once you specify your uh, underlying measure, let's say Lebesgue measure in RD, um, and you just have to specify this basically. And uh, so then the measure basically sample space and T of X, they determine the family. Okay. Um, so, um, and then the, the, okay, the omega naught in this case would be, so the theta would be called the natural parameter, canonical parameter. Omega naught would be called the natural parameter space, um, the canonical parameter space. And this, this natural parameter space is always a subset of RD okay, by construction. Right. So we're going to worry about these things. So I'm going to like replace this with theta for simplicity, and theta is in RD. Um, and you can see, for example, now the two parametric Gaussian family corresponds to these specifications. So x is R, and T of x is this. Once I specify these and our line measure is the Lebesgue measure, then, then the density has to be something like that with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Um, this turns out to be that log partition function. It has to be integrable. And you, you can argue that if theta 2 is um, either 0 or positive, then this is not going to integrate, right? Um, and so theta 2 has to be 0. So it has to be non-negative, but it's integral to be finite. And so that would give you the natural price. It's a natural price for theta 1 to be anything. Theta 2 really has to be negative. Um, you recognize later that if you go back to what we did, that this is really um, a Gaussian family in disguise because uh, it all turns out to be that it has this relations to, to, the, to the parameters that you know, which is the mean and the variance, but the natural parameters are something else. So the natural parameters are whatever you put here gets multiplied by those um, x and x2. So the thing is, if you didn't know about the Gaussian, you could have defined the Gaussian like this. So, 
to take um, the first and the second moment as your social statistic and this defines the family which turns out to be two parameters yeah sure. if you want you can put other things here so you add things here and then you get different distribution um so the Yashin is is one that has this quadratic uh, up to quadratic terms in, in helix and uh about something back yes yeah. is this not a problem with identifiability because we have two parameterizations that are going to be the same distribution no so the two parameterization is different than two parameters right so if you have um you can parameterize in terms of different parameters right so you can have different parameterizations of the same set of distribution once we work with this you don't want to take it through we're not necessarily worrying about the other participants so there's a one-to-one -one map between uh, the parameterization, which is mu and sigma squared. For every one of them, there is one like theta one and theta two, and vice versa. So you either work with this side or the other side, right? So always um, sounds good. Okay. Um, so if you have X, let's say, is RP, that nu tilde is the Lebesgue measure on RP. And if I define T of X to be all the monomials, basically, of degree at most two, right? X1, X2, X3, Xt, and then X1 is squared, X2 is squared all the way, and then the products. Okay, so all the monomials, basically, polynomials that are um, like this. Um, then the family that I get is the multivariate Gaussian. So the canonical natural family is like a multivariate Gaussian. The multivariate Gaussian is basically an exponential family where on, on RD that has the sufficient so if all these is these like polynomials of the D at most two, like monomials. And to each one I associate the parameter, theta one associated with this, theta i i. So this I, they're like p choose two uh, plus p. Uh, we have these interactions, right? So you have um, this set, the second half, you can write it as like x1 squared, x1, x2, x1, xp, and then x2 squared, x2, x3, and so on. So there's like a matrix here. Um, that part of the sufficient set is like that. Then I have to associate parameters with every one of them. So it's convenient to put a, all of these parameters into a matrix, theta 1, 1. And I'm going to put theta 2 one two here times the two is like for convenience as you'll see um i'm going to define it like that up to two theta one p and then theta two two and, and so on so to each one of these the statistics i have to associate parameters so that i multiply and then sum right so so this is the form that i get for the canonical exponential family associated with those monomials of the unit plus two um and so this is a, like a canonical family, natural parameter space. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky to figure out what the natural parameter space is if you don't know if it's a Gaussian. Gaussian. If you know it's a Gaussian, it's fine. But that's sort of the machinery that went into like um, understanding multivariate Gaussian. But in, in general, this is well defined. If you're the first person that arrives at this, you try to integrate, see where it integrates, and then it just defines this guy. Um, it's a little bit easier to write this in terms of um, a matrix notation sometimes. So you write this as inner product of theta and x. So you think of theta as um, just a vector. Um, this is associated with um, the, uh, uh, the x's here. And then the other one, as I mentioned, you put it in a matrix. So theta is a matrix such that the ij element is theta i theta j. Um, so it's a matrix that collects these theta i j's. Um, and then you can write it compactly, the, the first three terms as inner product of theta and x, and then inner product of capital theta and x, x transpose. So this matrix here, um, it's easy to see that this is really x, x transpose, where x is uh, x1 up to xp, right? Once you transpose it, this is the rank one matrix. And so 
this inner product is just between two matrices. Between two symmetric matrices, I can define an inner product. So if I have A and B, two symmetric matrices, I define the inner product to be just uh, A, I, J, B, I, J. Okay. For symmetric matrices, this is all the finer product. Um, and so that would be like, um, like this. Um, and you can also do like a bit of calculation to um, write it in a different way. So this, this can also be written as a trace. So a trace of AB. This is assuming A and B are symmetric. Um, so you can also write it as a trace of theta x, x transpose and then use the fact that trace is q by the invariant of the simple permutations. And this would be x transpose theta x and comes up x transpose theta x. Uh, this is sometimes useful because it's like a scalar. In any case, so this is like multivariate Gaussian in the canonical form, right? If you want to write it as a canonical exponential family, that's how you write it. Um, the next question is that, like, how does these parameters uh, respond to the original parameters, which is to the next slide, but it's similar to this case. So you can write down the usual way that you know the density of the multivariate Gaussian, and then like, Set it equal to this and figure out the correspondence. So this is a, a family of rank, sometimes called the rank. Okay, uh, I should have said dimension or rank of the family is the number of, uh, like the dimension of the sufficient statistic. So that's the rank of the family. Um, maybe if I'm not, I think probably this is wrong. Maybe this should be plus. But um, just how many how many things do you have here? Um, this is like p choose two, and then plus p. So that would be this term, and then plus p here. So I think that's the rank. Okay, so the rank is uh, more than p. If you think about this. Okay, uh, and then you set it equal to this was the usual like probably how people. Remember, uh, multivariate Gaussian you usually have a mean parameter and a covariance matrix. So, and then this is the density. Uh, the determinant appears here, inverse of sigma there. Uh, so, you expand and you compare with this. Um, you recognize this like notation that, that we had here that this um, is really x transpose theta x. And, like, you equate and then you see that theta is like this, this other parameter theta is basically proportional to negative of sigma squared, sorry, sigma inverse. So sigma inverse is called the precision matrix. It's like the inverse of the variance of precision. And so that capital theta is a negative of the precision matrix, like we scale. Uh, and then a theta turns out to be this, um, which is what it is. Okay, so it's a multivariate, interesting multivariate function, we'll see that in exponential families, this A is a convex function. So this turns out to be a convex function by the results that we'll see. And it's not so obvious. So these exponential families are sources of interesting convex functions because it's, it comes from exponential family. You just equate this and then this interesting object pops out. In your like homework problems, you investigate convexity of this. But there is a general result I think like we'll see that tells you that this is um, always convex in an exponential term. So, in any case, this is the correspondence between the original parameters and the um, your familiar parameters. Sorry, familiar parameters and the canonical parameters. Okay, this is a little bit fast, but I guess you guys can like work it out. It's just algebra. Okay, um, sounds good. So there is an um, interesting interpretation of this canonical form. When you write it in this canonical form, um, in this canonical form, um, the, um, so the density factorizes uh, a, a like, um, so this is easy to see how, like when you have a bunch of exponentials, um, you can, uh, you end up, for example, being able to, for example, maybe write it as um, exponential of um, a subset of the variables, let's say, uh, x like s1, and then exponential of 
x s2. These are like subsets of the variable. So you can get factorizations of the distribution like this. And, and the factorizations can be translated into a graph. Um, so um, this is a topic which is um, which we, we won't cover. But basically, the locations, the locations where theta i j is 0, um, if you if you basically de de design a graph or like, um, let me, let me be, okay, how can I, suppose theta is like, um, you have four and then uh, four elements, P is four, and you have four potential rows and four potential, um, Oh, and some of them are, um, so let's say these are non-zero, non and some other parts are non-zero, for example, uh, then the rest are zero, okay? Uh, maybe, okay, uh, maybe two and three are also non-zero. So the diagonal is not rather critical, um, but the non-diagonal parts are. So suppose something like this happens, I can define a graph, um, based on one, two, three, four. Um, so I'm going to put an edge between every two pairs uh, for which the corresponding entry in theta is non-zero. Okay, so one and four would be one, and then two and three would be one. Okay, the rest, because they're not, okay, let me, let's have one more. Oh, not, not one more. So, so this is going to be, uh, the graph associated with this. So among all potential edges, I'm going to zero out the ones for which theta ij is zero. Okay, so this graph then would describe, um, you can show that would describe the conditional independence statements in the original density or distribution. So for example, uh, separation in this graph would imply conditional independence in, in the original one. So for example, if I can separate, I can like find, um, there's a separation here. So for example, if I, um, the separation is not quite good. Um, yeah, okay, so this is not a good example, but let's say I have a graph, um, like compli more complicated. So you end up having a complicated graph. What happens is that if, if I can, for example, find a set of nodes here, um, that if I remove them, I separate this part, for example, from this part. Um, this would get separated from uh, these two. Then, uh, so you can say that, uh, let's call this A, let's call this B, let's call this S. You can say X sub A um, is independent of X sub B given X sub S. So X sub A is all the variables that are, um, all the nodes that are there, which is one here. And then B would be all those two variables. So um, this variable, condition on these three variables is going to be independent of that. So basically, separation in the graph that is induced by theta gives you conditional independent statement in the original um, distribution. So this is like a very like tip of the iceberg. So this from this like graphical modeling sort of starts. So this is an example where we have an exponential family, which is also a graphical model. So um, graphical model means there is a graph that describes its conditional independencies. And the way you construct the graph is basically the edges are defined by the uh, like non-zero pattern, um, like the sparsity or non-sparsity of data. Okay, so this link I just point out because there's a lot of interest in, in understanding how you can represent independent conditional independence statements in, in multivariate distributions. And this is an example where immediately once you write it down, because of the zero pattern of theta, you can write down this. And um, so when you view the Gaussian exponential family in this fashion, it's usually called the uh, Gaussian Markov random field. So if you see Gaussian Markov random field, it's basically a multivariate Gaussian, but we use um, in this lens, like usually from the effect of the precision, the zeros of precision defines this graph. Um, and the separation in this graph implies, like describes conditional independent state. For example, uh, another one would be any any kind of separation that you can imagine. For example, uh, these two guys would separate um, 
Um, so this set would separate this guy and this guy. So given this two, these parts would be independent. So it's very easy to read conditional independence statements. Uh, why this follows, I'm not like proving it, but just describing what happens down here. So there's this link between exponential. So this is like at the intersection of a lot of things. So it's like Gaussian multivariates. So you already know it has a lot of interesting properties, but it's also an exponential family. It's also a graphical model. And so um, this view of viewing it in terms of the canonical parameter, the canonical parameter has a very nice tie to like the graphical interpretation of it. Okay. Whereas this, the original sigma doesn't. So zero pattern of this does not factor into this, but zero pattern of the precision matrix basically comes into play here. Okay. Questions? This was a little fast. But... Is it the data as an adjacency matrix? So they normalize it first to get to the adjacency matrix? Or... Good. So there, this is an adjacency. So the adjacency matrix would be basically the, uh, the adjacency matrix you read from this. So you don't care about the values. So yeah, the zero zeros are yeah, yeah. 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 You can think of this as defining the adjacency matrix. You can put base here, but the base, you don't care. Yeah. Okay, so if you understood this, I can sort of extend this idea to define sort of multivariate distributions, other uh, spaces that have this kind of factorization, kind of independent structure. So if you uh, take that P of X, but change the underlying uh, space from RP to like the cube, zero, one to the P. Like suppose I have zero, one to the P, this would be counting measure, but I'm going to use the same statistic. Um, that would give you a dis discrete distribution analog of the multivariate Gaussian. So you would have, or actually, okay, you have, you have to have like minus one and one. Zero would be a little problematic. But let's say uh, I have minus one and one um, to the end. That's my x. Uh, and then t of x is like that. So x i's. Um, you can also do it for a general graph, actually. So suppose you have a graph. Um, and I'm going to include um, all the points uh, that are associated with the node and all the interactions associated with the edges of the graph. At the start, we can assume that like, um, this is the entire, it's all the interaction. I don't need to put the xi squared here. xi squared are going to be one, right? Because things are plus minus one. So these are all the quadratics that they need. So you pick up a graph, um, it has an edge set, it has a, like a um, set of vertices, set of edges. So the vertices for us would be like N basically. And then I'm gonna like just include these um, because you can see if, if um, I could like force some of these to be zero, like there is some underlying graph. I don't need those parameters anymore. Um, so the, the corresponding, um, um, for the non-zero ones, I'm going to put a theta here. Okay. For the um, then this would be um, uh, the corresponding exponential family. So we have an exponential family with this um, p of x under language x counting, um, and this is a, the, the analog of the Gaussian in the discrete case, and it's called an Ising one. Okay. So it, it has this interesting multivariate, uh, like models multivariate interaction among um, a bunch of very like uh, binary variable. So this comes from statistical physics. These are like spins of objects, like uh, I don't know atoms. Do they have a spins or what? Or what are like particles? Or so they have spins and then they um, probably not uh, atoms, but probably electrons and stuff like that. And so this this defines a distribution. And so the, the, this measures the degree of interaction among. Uh, so if you have, for example, a lattice. Um, So the graph is a lattice, usually like in statistical physics, it's a lattice. It's like uh, some sort of a ferromagnetic material. And so these terms would be there uh, for all, for example, if I look at one node here, um, um, all the terms that are interact like interactions from these guys would be there. So if this is x1, x2, x3, x4. So we get x1, x2, x1, x3, x1, x4, x1, x5. Um, and so these would be there, 
And so um, if, for example, theta is positive, uh, whenever the spins of the neighbors all align, then it's more likely to have the same spin for this. Because if this is positive, theta is positive, you increase the probability. If they're like um, mismatched and theta is positive, that would reduce the probability. So if theta is positive, it would encourage the matching of those neighboring spins. And um, this defines a joint distribution. There are interesting things that happen, like phase transitions, things like that. Uh, at a certain level, if the levels of thetas are big, then the entire thing sort of flips, everything flips to like high probability, everything has the same spin, or like there is a disordered version, like you know, the state. So a lot of interesting things happen uh, um, based, on, based on this, but I just want to point out that this is the equivalent of the Gaussian. And then you can try to uh, estimate the parameters that the technology that we develop, like everything that we talked about, like works for this and the Gaussian. In this case, the log partition function, for example, is not easy to calculate. You have to sum basically over all the space to actually calculate this. So this would be like the log of summation of two to the n things. So calculating log partition function in this case is actually non-trivial. And uh, like a lot of the uh, issues with estimating parameters in this model will come from the fact that this is not easy to calculate. But in any case, so this is like a very brief introduction. This is another tip of another iceberg. Okay, so. Just, just to point out that these exponential families are quite versatile in, in modeling questions. One more example, okay, from discrete objects. So suppose you have, uh, you, you happen to, oh, then I just lost the, sorry, let's see. You guys don't see. Okay, back again. So suppose you want to put a probability distribution of family of um, probability distribution of the space of graphs. Um, so X would be the space of graphs on N nodes. Uh, as long as I can define these function functionals, let's say, on the space. So suppose I have real value functions on the space of graphs, and usually um, functions of graph that are of interest, for example, are counts of subgraphs. So if you count, for example, the number of edges, um, that would be a functional. So if you give me a graph, it has a number of some certain number of edges. It has a very over the space of graphs. This is very interesting. Or real numbers and the number of triangles, number of let's say stars of certain kind. So you keep a collection of them. So this defines uh, a sufficient statistic, and then you can form the exponential family again. The other language of counting because this space is discrete, but this defines a family of probability measures on um, graphs. And then the log partition function is again difficult to calculate. Uh, these are called exponential random graph models, and they have they have been of interest in, in trying to um, like model a stochastic collection of networks. Um, they have issues in trying to, but even sampling from this would be a little bit tricky. Yeah, so you have the distribution, you have the density, but how do you sample like a graph from this? You could do, for example, git sampling or CRT, but things are not that easy. But I just want to point out that. It's possible to do exotic objects. Okay. You have any like kind of interesting set of objects, you want to put a family distribution on them, as long as you can define functionals, they're like measurements of a certain kind, then you could you could define an exponential family. Okay. They're not just univariate or bivariate things. Okay. Okay. We tried, but we didn't manage to finish. Just one more slide and then uh, it's hard to finish in one lecture, but uh, so the exponential family is um, the other property I mentioned is in full rank canonical exponential family. A is convex um, on its domain, and from that it follows that actually the domain has to be convex as well. So once you prove this, um, uh, this is like a generalized function, so it can have infinite values. But but once it's, you prove this convex, it forces the domain to also be convex. So the domain, the canonical parameter space is convex, and the function is convex. You're going to prove this in your homework problems using the whole layers inequality. I'm going to give another proof later using a different technique. Okay, but this gives you a lot of interesting sources of um, 
convex uh, functions. So this is the result. Next time I'm going to come and, and prove, and this gives you the alternative proof. Um, in an exponential family, the derivatives of A would give you interesting information about the sufficient statistics. So the first derivative, the gradient, would give you the mean. Um, the Hessian would give you the covariance. Okay. And this A turns out to be like infinitely smooth in the interior of so next time we're going to come and improve this and, and, and a bunch of other properties thank you guys uh see you next time